as an individual in his prayer time, he felt led to preach this message in 1985 in a church in Times Squares to the masses because he's seen these things coming to America today. And, and this man, he, he, right now he passed on and he, he's with the Lord right now. But I can imagine how he would feel if he was alive today just to see everything he preached came into fruition and what we're seeing manifested to the churches today, right? Um, look at your neighbor and say, thank God you're here. Look at yourself, point at yourself and say, self, I'm glad I'm here. Amen. So um, last week, we finished the first message, I would say, of the new series we started called Awaken. As I referenced last week, I said that I believe that God is awakening the church today. Um, earlier today, I had a, a, br a brief meeting with my leaders, and I told them, I said, I believe that God is actually shaking up the church, and he's alleviating individuals out of the church. He's separating the sheep from the goat. I believe that. I believe that because when we get into this message, you'll understand why I said that. Um, the message that I started today, we're going to go ahead and deviate from the book that we was reading. We was reading uh, based off of the book of 2 Thessalonians. Last week, we finished chapter 1. This week, we were supposed to start chapter 2, but I, I felt led to be deviated from that because there's a reference in that specific scripture in chapter 2 that would reference the gospel according to Satan. So there is among us a gospel that does not worship the same Jesus that we think that according to scripture. There is a gospel among us. In fact, um, as I was doing my studies, there's actually 10 gospels that is polluting America today. And it's not referencing to the same Jesus that we worship of the scripture. And I, I, I would not do you justice if I preached that whole message in one segment. So today I would say it's going to be the introduction, if you will. So it's the introduction of the gospel according to um, Satan. Next week, we'll go ahead and we'll, we'll, we'll elaborate more. And then the third week, we'll go ahead and elaborate based on those 10 gospels that is being preached in the churches, um, excuse me, today. Uh, let us pray. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you for this opportunity, Lord God, to go ahead and speak to your people. I thank you for your grace, your mercy. I thank you for your love, Lord Jesus. I thank you for those that walked into this place thinking that they're just going to hear another Bible study, Lord God. We know that this is divine encounter, Lord Jesus. You brought them here, and I thank you, Jesus. As for me, Father God, I ask that you alleviate my emotions, my thoughts, Father God, and use me for the glory of God. For those that came in here, Father God, with hardened hearts, Lord Jesus, or, or minds filled with confusion or questions, God, Father, I pray that their, answer, their, their questions are answered tonight, Jesus. I thank you, Father God, for your people that are in here. I thank you for those that are watching us through social media, Father God, and through, through our media platforms, Father God. I thank you for it. And man, Lord, just, man, do what you do best, Jesus. Transform lives, Lord God. Use me as your willing vessel. And I pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. So as we, as we get ready to start, first, I want to thank everybody for, for being here. I want to thank for those that are watching us through um through Instagram, social media, and those who are watching us through our podcast and YouTube. Um, I thank God for this opportunity. As I was reading earlier today, there was a, um, well, actually, I heard this illustration. It was about a man who was visiting his doctor. As he was visiting his doctor, he looked at his doctor and he says, doctor, I need to speak to you because I believe my wife needs to be in here because she's having a hard time to hear, right? And, and, and the doctor asked him, he says, man, I need you to explain this for me. You know, I need you to explain, what do you mean that your wife is having a hard time hearing? He says, well, he says, how bad is it? He says, well, it's so bad that we don't even conversate no more. I don't even remember the last time me and her had even a, a brief conversation, like a, a conversation, right? And he says, okay, well, I need you to check something out for we can see how bad this is, how bad she can't hear. I need you to do the, the distant test. So when you get home, you do the distant test to see how bad it is that she can't hear. He says, okay, I'm going to do the distant test. So as he went home, he kicked the door open and he screamed out. He says, Helen, what's for dinner? Nothing. He heard nothing. He went into the hallway of the house. He says, Helen, what's for dinner? Nothing. So he walked into the kitchen. He's seen his wife bending over in the kitchen, moving the food. And he asked her, he says, Helen, real loud, what's for dinner? Nothing. And as he walked up to her, he went up and he says, Helen, he screamed at her, what's for dinner? She says, for the fourth time, I said chicken. <laughs> 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 
Haven't many of us been through a situation like that before? I believe that scripture is telling us for us to have ears to hear what the Spirit of God is saying. A lot of the times we like to point to other individuals as if the message is for them, but the message is really for you. I pray that everyone in this place have ears to hear what the Spirit of God is saying. As we start off with this series, the series is titled Awaken, but this message is called The Gospel According to Satan. There is a message out there. There is another gospel. In fact, we'll get into the specific verses in a second, but there is another gospel out there that is not the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ in which we who read the Bible proclaim and were redeemed from, right? So according to, um, actually, there's actually some statistics that I want to talk about because the message or the primary thing that I want to speak of is something called the apostasy. The apostasy, I believe, is something that's going to lead um, is something that's going to happen before the, coming of the, uh, before the coming of Christ. And I'll elaborate that in a second. But I want to read something as far as a statistic. The statistic says nearly half of young adults with ties to Christianity say church can't answer their questions. Church can't answer their questions. This statistic actually came out from the Barnes Group, which is a known Christian organization that goes around asking young adults and asking grown um, individuals or adults alike these specific questions, and they get the statistics based off of what individuals answer. And a majority of young adults believe that the church can't answer their questions, so that's why they deviate from the church, they leave the church, they stop praying, they leave God, and they go elsewhere. So then they attach themselves to other spiritual things, if you will. They attach themselves to horoscopes. They attach themselves to rocks, Santeria, things of those sort. They attach themselves to things that won't mean nothing when they see Jesus face to face. So it says young adults, uh, it says extensive new research from the Barn Group shows that nearly half of young adults worldwide who have connection to Christianity feel that the church can't answer their questions. Barna, a California-based evangelic research firm, partnered with leading international evangelism organizations, World Visions, to comply the connected generation. And the study says that a research report says the study is based on a survey of 15,369 young adults between the ages of 18 to 35 in 25 different countries. And these individuals, each and every one of them says that the church cannot answer their questions. And if we target the, these individuals, these are individuals who grew up in the church who experienced Christianity, who says they have professions of faith in Christ. They profess the faith to Christ. They say that God went into their life. They felt the Holy Spirit, but yet they departed away from the faith. The scripture has an answer to this, and that answer is called apostasy. Apostasy. So the Bible teaches that everyone who is born again by the power of the Holy Spirit is saved forever. You cannot lose your salvation if you are saved. I'm going to emphasize it again. You cannot lose your salvation if you are saved. The reason why I'm emphasizing this because what we're going to get into is easy to point to yourself and say, man, I'm an apostate. Man, I done fell off. Oh, man, I, I'm one of them. I want you to understand something. The Bible teaches everyone who is born again by the power of the Holy Spirit is saved forever. We receive the gift of eternal life according to John chapter 10, verse 28, and not temporary life. This life is not temporary, it's eternal life. Someone who is born again, John 3.3, 3, cannot be unborn. They cannot be unborn. After being adopted into God's family, according to Romans chapter 8.15, you cannot be kicked out of God's family. It, it, it's not like how when we grew up and we think that, um, you know, I did something bad so my family don't want me, they disown me. My friends disown me. Everyone disowned me because I fell into my sin or I fell into whatever it is or I wronged you, I offended you, I did all these things. You still will not get kicked out of the kingdom of God. In fact, you have the opportunity to repent and come to Christ and confess of your sins. Amen? So even this, when God starts a work, he finishes it according to Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. So if you trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior, God started a work within you, and guess what? He's going to finish that work, right? So it gives us relief because it, at times we think we could do this on our own when we can't do this on our own. We need Christ. That's why we came to him in the first place, right? So the child of God, the believer in Jesus Christ, is eternally secure, watch this, forever. There is nothing that you can do to snatch yourself out of God's hands. Nothing. 
right? In fact, however, Scripture does teaches us something. Scripture teaches us a, a warning against apostasy. These warnings have led to some to doubt the doctrine of salvation. Because as individuals who are in the faith, individuals who we see grew up in the church, or individuals, put it like this, elite pastors, right now, in the midst of me talking, they're actually denying Christianity today. I'm talking about scholars in the faith. I'm talking about individuals who had doctrine degrees. Literally, if I, if I were to print out the, the, the list from 2020, from starting from COVID until right now, literally over 10 individuals who were considered individuals that we would look up on the internet to look at their research of what they said about God has renounced Christianity. Individuals that we follow, and I'm not going to say their names, Individuals that we watch preach constantly, that we, that we thought that we're living the righteous life, are individuals who have renounced Christianity and watched it. They said, I am more happier than I've ever been. Deception. That's what that is. Deceived. Because when they see Jesus face to face, you would have to give an account for leading many astray. So even this, it says, um, I, want you to, I want to give a reminder to you. The reminder is this. If you can write this in your notebook... Write it real big so whenever you feel discouraged or if you feel like you want to just derail from Christianity or if you feel like, uh, man, this is too heavy, I can't take this on, I want you to remember something. Satan is a liar. He lies about the biggest subject. The The biggest subject is God. He also lies about the biggest need. Watch this. The biggest need is salvation. So whenever Satan lies to you, he tries to derail you and tries to taint God's, God's, who he is, his personal character, and he also tries to derail you from salvation. So the biggest need and the biggest subject, which is God and salvation. So whenever the devil's at work in you, he causes you to doubt. Genesis chapter 3, that's how they fell. He causes you to doubt God's character, and he also tries to derail you from Scripture. Right, so the question would be, if we cannot lose our salvation, why are we warned against falling away? So the word apostasy literally means the falling away. I want to read a portion of scripture to you, Um, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We would not dissect this verse. Um, We would dissect it in the coming weeks. We would go line for line dissecting what the the original language is saying about this verse. But right now, I'm just going to read something briefly because I think it's very important that led me to this message. It says this in chapter 2, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. It says this, Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be shaken, watch this, in mind or troubled. Watch this, not to be shaken in mind or troubled. That is very important for us to acknowledge that because the first, the first attempt to attack you, when Satan comes after you, he comes straight for your mind. That's why he says, renew your mind what? Daily. This is something that we're supposed to do all the time because it's a constant battle in the mind. If he could get you to backslide or if he could get you to doubt or if he could get you to make you feel some type of way towards your brother and or your sister or if he can make you feel even some type of way towards God, that's exactly what he's going to do. So he says this, he says, now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter or as if us, as it comes from us. Um, Quick background, history tells us that after the first Thessalonian letter, right, there uh, uh, there was a group of individuals that pretty much tainted the gospel. They were called Judaizers. So they would come and they would say that the gospel is not a, a gospel of grace, like you have to trust Jesus, but you have to add works to that. You have to add abide to the law. You have to do all these things because they felt that Paul's message was an easy message. Can I tell you that the gospel is an easy message? It is so easy that it it is so complex to the human mind. None of us can really understand it. I believe that it's going to take eternity for us to understand the the, the redemption of man. Right? So he he says that individuals came. They sent a letter to the Thessalonian church right after Paul came and he sent his letter. They sent another letter telling them that they were living in the last days. They said, man, the reason why you're experiencing persecution is because you are living in the last days. Jesus already came, and right now you're in the great tribulation, which is a lie, right? So so he's telling them, he says, um, 
either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if, as if it was from us, as though the day of Christ had come. And then he goes this. He says, let no one deceive you by any means. Deception plays a major key in apostasy. An individual cannot fall from the faith unless he is deceived. I'm going to say it again. You cannot fall from the faith unless you're deceived. Watch this. Individuals who profess Christ as Lord and Savior and fall from the faith, they were already deceived and they were never saved in the first place. Even the biggest scholars, even the doctrine degrees, even the mat, whatever it is, even the biggest scholars who portrayed God into the best character by letter, if they fell from the faith and renounced Christianity, they never knew him. So we go, he goes this, he says, let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will come unless the falling away comes first. The falling away in the Greek term, and the Greek translation in its original excuse me, language, it means apostasy. Unless the apostasy come first. If you have your Bibles in, in different interpretations, this is the New King James Version. King James will probably say apostasy. Your other translators probably say apostasies. But this version says, unless the fallen away comes first. The fallen away is the apostasy. Many um, scholars would say, oh, um, he's talking about the falling away or he, he's talking about the rapture of the church. It, that's, not, that's not what the scripture says. That's not what he's saying. Because when we read the uh, definition of that, it literally means the apostasy, individual who was of me, but not really of me. What do you mean? Uh, elaborate for me. How can the, the genuine gospel deceive someone? The thing is, when someone's deceived, they don't, know, they, they don't know they're deceived. Usually, I always say this, uh, usually when an individual say, I'm not deceived, gives a better chance of them being deceived. It takes an honest individual, an individual as humble to say, man, I might be deceived. You know, uh, it, it takes a prideful person, which is the opposite of the fruit of the spirit, to be like, yo, I ain't deceived. I can't be deceived. That's pride. That means you might be deceived. Does that make sense? So that's why the Bible calls us to study the scripture um, diligently, if you will. You know what I'm saying? And we'll get into that even more. So don't worry about it. So the question would be, if we can lose our salvation, why are we warned against the falling away of the, the Lord? Understand that apostasy is the sign of the coming of Christ. It's an indication that Christ is at the door. Many scholars would even say that um, apostasy is actually the lights on the runway when a plane is getting ready to land. That, that's what apostasy is. I believe that even within this text, because it says that let no one deceive you by any means for the day of the Lord will come unless the falling away comes forth and the man of sin is revealed. I believe that the great apostasy that this scripture speaks of won't take place until uh, the Antichrist is, appears. Everyone is going to attach themselves to that false Messiah. So that is a great falling away. Individuals who profess Christ as Lord and Savior, they're going to think that, that, that man of the Antichrist is the real Messiah. So they're going to fall away from the real gospel to a false gospel, which is this man that appear, appears. But I do believe that we are experiencing that apostasy right now, the residue of it. Like the world is preparing for the apostasy, if you will. So many scholars would say that it is the runway. It's as if the more we get closer to Christ coming, the more people will fall away. That's why I believe that Christ and God is purging the church, separating the goat from the sheep. I believe that he's taking out and he's doing a new thing in the church. I believe that because it's evident all around the world. If we literally look at what's going on in the Middle East, let's not look at America. Let's look at China and how they're being persecuted. Let's look at Iran, how they're literally experiencing revival. Individual Muslims who were Muslims their whole life, they were, they're being encountered by Christ in their dreams, telling them, I am the Messiah, trust me as your Lord and Savior. And they're renouncing the Muslim faith and they're coming, watch this, by the millions, not, just, not hundreds, millions renouncing the Muslim faith. There is revival going on all around the world, and um, people are being aware that there is a Jesus, and he is coming soon. 
Apostasy from the Greek word apostasia means a defiance of established system or authority. It means a rebellion, an abandonment, or a breach of faith. That's what it means. It means an apostate is someone who abandons his religious faith. Someone who abandons his religious faith. Excuse me. um, Yeah. His abandoned his uh, religious faith. It is clear from the Bible that apostates are people who made professions of faith in Jesus, but never genuinely received him as their Lord and Savior. They never did. I, I don't care how many times they came up to the altar. I don't, and, and, but if they're quick to jump ship when trials come, you were never really saved. You did not grasp the full gospel. When trials come or if you feel offended by someone, you're like, I don't want to be in Christianity because it doesn't suit my needs or the way I want it to portray to me. So you jump ship. Those are individuals who are considered apostates, individuals who never encountered the Lord Jesus Christ. Truly. Are there individuals who will be offended by the gospel and then they feel church hurt and they probably deviated into the world a little bit, but yet they feel this conviction and, they, and, they're, and they're, they're just battling. There are individuals who are genuinely saved, but they're battling. There are individuals like that, but individuals who, um, I would say, literally denounce the faith completely are individuals that scripture says they were never believers in the first place. So they were pretend believers. Those who turn away from Christ never really trusted him to begin with. As 1 John chapter 2 verse 19 says, they went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belong to us. They're going. That is the key. They're going. Meaning your destination, the way you live your life, where are you going points you to some place. If you trust Christ as Lord and Savior, it's automatically going to always point to Christ. But if you have an emotional experience with Christ, it's always going to deviate you somewhere else. They're going. In fact, to back this up, John chapter 6, real quick, verse 59 says, Verse 59 says, and he said um, this while he was teaching in the synagogue, he says, on hearing this, many of his disciples, this is a hard teaching. Who could accept it? That's what the individuals are saying. God, Jesus had over 200 um, disciples, right? But when everyone left, it was only 12 left standing. So he says this, he says, who can accept it? Aware that the disciples were grumbling this, Jesus said to him, he says, does this offend you? Living in a generation, a millennial generation, a Gen Z generation, even even going back to the baby boomers, individuals who feel offended because the gospel does not suit their needs. Individuals, when you say something uh, contrary to what they feel, believe that a lot of them feel offended. We live in an offensive generation. Everyone gets offended by everything. I don't like what the preachers say. I ain't coming back to that church. I'm going to tell you what the Bible says about you. You're an individual who have itching ears. And we'll get into that in a second. But watch this. He says this. It's just crazy because this was 2,000 years ago. He says this. Does this offend you? He says, then what if you see the Son of Man ascends to where he was before? To heaven. Watch. And then he says this. The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the Spirit and life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. That is a scary thing to have the Savior of the world the one who would judge all to say there are some of you who stand in the church, who sit in the pews, yet you do not believe. That is a fearful thing. Very fearful thing. Then he goes this, he says, for Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who had betrayed him, who would betray him. I love this because a lot of things, a lot of individuals think they can fool people, but they can never fool God. It is evident you can never fool him. I, I, I love what Francis Chan always says. Francis Chan says, man, it's important for you to understand what salvation is. It's, an, it's important for you to really come to Christ, right? Because he says that, he says, like, who are you going to fool? Like, like, if you go, die and you go to hell, what are you going to be in hell saying, ah, I fooled them. They think I'm in heaven? Like, no, that's not, that's not what's going to happen. You're literally going to regret every single thing that you have done. So it's better for you to get right now why the opportunity provides itself, right, or allows itself, than to, to, than to die and to experience eternal separation from the Lord. And then he says, um, 
This is, why, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled him or has drawn them. He says, from this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Um, as I was reading some of the individuals um, renounce, as they renounce their Christianity, a lot, of them, it, a lot of them sounds like this right here. A lot of them sounds like if they, they feel hurt by God, in a sense, as if, as if God did not fulfill their needs, as if, as if they wanted to do other things, but they felt entrapped by God, as if there is no freedom in Christ Jesus. That, you know what that is? A lie is a deception of the enemy. And we'll get into that in the coming weeks. But then it says this in the end, in the end of that verse, it says, uh, it says they no longer followed him. And then he said to the, he said pretty much to his disciples, he says, do you want to leave? Do you want to leave too? Do you? And Jesus asked the 12, Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? I pray that everyone in these pews are individuals who say, whom shall we go? There is no one else to go to but the Lord Jesus. Everyone else is false. Everyone else is in the grave. There's only one that rose from the grave and that sits at the right hand of Father. His name is Jesus. So, and it goes, so even this, those who apostates are simply demonstrating that they are not true believers and they were never were. That's why holiness is a hard task for these individuals. That's why being set apart is a hard task because these individuals never really came to faith. Everything that they was doing was work-based. Everything they were doing, they were trying to earn their way into salvation or earn their way into heaven, if you will. That's why it was hard for them to, 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 to flee from fornication, flee from less temptation, for flee from these things, to be set apart because these individuals never confessed their sins and never truly grasped what the, the gift of salvation really was. The Bible warns against apostasy, the apostasy existence, because there are two types of religious people. Yes, two types of religious people, believers and unbelievers. Yes, you can be a religious person and be an unbeliever. How? You believe in Santeria, don't you? You believe in voodoo, don't you? You believe in uh, astrology, don't you? You believe in this new age movement. You worship rocks. You, uh, you, you shoot dust in the air. I don't know what you do. You do all that stuff, right? You got the little the sage thing. You going like this in your house thinking they're taking away demons. You drawing them in. All that, right? You can be a religious individual but not a believer. So in any church, there are, two, there, those, are, there are those who truly trusted Christ and those who are going through the motion. Wearing the label of Christianity does not guarantee, listen to this, a heart change. The label of Christianity does not guarantee a heart change. It is possible to hear the word of God and truth without taking it to heart. It's possible to sit under a, a, a sound teacher, receive the word, but not take it to heart. And it is a scary thing. It is possible to attend church, serve in the ministry, and call yourself a Christian and still be unsaved, according to Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 and 23. He says, many among them would say to me in the last time, he says, Lord, Lord, didn't I do this? Depart from me, I never knew you. Why? Because they never had a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. You could serve, you could do anything you want in the church, but you never knew him. That's why the book of Isaiah 29 in Mark chapter 7 says this, these people come to me with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. My brothers and sisters, evaluate yourself, evaluate your heart. Is your heart far from God? Are you, are, you, are you responding to the gift of grace? Are you responding to the gift of salvation? Is God tugging on your heart and you're just pushing him away? Now is not the time to push him away. If we look at what's going on in the world, if we look at what's going on in social media, if we look at the news, if we, if we have friends, I'm pretty sure, that are, that are probably dying or individuals that you encounter day to day that, that you know that they, they're not right, you would see that we are living in a crucial times. And it's very important for us to evaluate ourselves. Have I received them with my heart or am I going through the motions? God warns the pretenders who sits in the pew and hears the gospel on Sunday after Sunday. He is playing with fire. Eventually, a pretender would apostate and he will fall away from the faith he once professed if he does not repent. Like, um, like the tares among the wheat in Matthew chapter um, 13, 
his true nature will start to manifest among the people. Apostate, uh, individual who is apostate has a profession of faith at one time, but does not possess the faith. So they profess it, but they don't possess it. So there's a difference. You can say it all you want to, but is it in you? Is it bearing fruit for the glory of God? People nowadays preach the gospel of self-fulfillment. They would say God love is boundless. We could do whatever we want with no bounds and God will still love us. That is a false gospel. That is a false gospel. In fact, man, a lot of the mega churches, as we heard my brother David Wilkerson preaching, a lot of the mega churches nowadays are preaching this, this gospel. In fact, they, they would use that song, uh, the 99, he chases after one for, as a as justification of this. And that is a false gospel. It's called the gospel of self-fulfillment. I could do whatever I want and God's still going to love me. I already said the prayer. The prayer saved me, but my life doesn't have to match. Like I I seen a post earlier this week that that, that got me upset because it says something along the lines, oh, um, who said I don't have to look like a Christian to be saved or some junk like that? Uh, According to scripture, the Bible says that it was evident by their fruit. You will know them by their fruit. So yes, you have to look like a Christian. What you mean, if you don't look like a Christian, no one knows you're a Christian, so you might not be a Christian. So, and it says this, um, according to Galatians chapter 1, yeah, Galatians chapter 1, 8, um, there is another gospel. In fact, he says, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you, watch, to live in the grace of Christ and turning to a different gospel. Paul's emphasizing there is another gospel among us. In fact, if we go back to scripture in the book of Matthew, Jesus would emphasize, he says, there are many Christs among you. In Jesus' time, he says there were false Christs among them. So how much more Christs are there out there now? A lot, right? So he says, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. It's not a gospel, it's a false gospel, it's a false hope. Watch what he says after this, right? He says, um, evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion. (laughs) So there are individuals who are preaching this false gospel to you. He says, they're throwing you into confusion and you are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But watch this. He says, but even if we... I like that he put himself in there. He says, even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you another gospel other than the one we preach to you, let that man be accursed. King James Version, let that person be damned. Like he gives no false hope to the false teacher. Let that person be eternally damned, experience eternal judgment. That's how serious the, uh, the, the severity of the real gospel is. It is worth hell fire if you reject it and if you teach something else contrary to what scripture says. So he said, and I love what he does. He says, um, he says, let them be a curse. And he says, as we have already said, so now I say it again. I, I don't think you heard me the first time. Let me say it again. I like this because then he says, if anybody preaches to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let that person be under God's accurse. And he says, and he says, am I now trying to win the approval of human beings? So now we got the motive of why they preach another gospel. I get it now. They're trying to win the approval of man instead of the approval of God. He, seeker friendly. So he's telling you, he says, am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? So the reason why another false gospel or another gospel is among the mist, even in our churches in America, is because they're simply trying to please people and not God, which causes apostasy, individuals to fall away from the faith. And then he goes this and he says, um, he says, if I were if I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. If you're a people pleaser, you are not a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. If you're an individual who compromises the gospel, compromises your Christian walk, I, 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 I don't want to offend that person. I don't want to tell him he's living wrong. I don't want to say, man, homosexuality is a sin. I don't, I don't want to say um, new age is wrong. I, I don't want to do this, man, because you want to please the people, right? Instead of pleasing God. Watch this. If anyone else preaches another gospel, 
Let that person be accursed. Let that person be damned. There is no hope for a false teacher. None. And then he goes this, and it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 4, it says, For if someone comes to you and preaches a Jesus, other than the Jesus we preach, or if you received a different spirit from the spirit you received or a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put with easily enough. Meaning you would be directed, you, it, it would be evident in your life that you put up with a false Jesus in a false spirit. Right? That's why I'm going to say it. I really don't care. Um, that's why when I see uh, certain movements, when, when they say that they're manifesting in the spirit and these things are going, they're going crazy on the stage, they said the spirit of God is in this place, when that contradicts the scripture. The Bible says that the spirit of God is self-controlled, so why are you running crazy in the church? It doesn't add enough. Why, 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 why is everyone speaking some other thing, some other language, but the scripture says that it is a gift, meaning a gift is not given to every individual. So that means that is a, someone's lying, someone's preaching another gospel in that church, and you have fell in love with the emotional roller coaster that you're experiencing in that gathering and not the Lord Jesus Christ of the Bible. My brothers and sisters, man, if you are experiencing this today, who are watching us online, YouTube podcast, anyone in this place, if you're experiencing today, I challenge you to read the scripture because it's a contradiction to what the scripture says. It is not the true gospel. You fell in love with emotion and not the Lord Jesus Christ. Because sometimes I don't feel Jesus. Sometimes I feel alone. But I know what the truth says. I will never leave nor forsake you. So therefore, I stand on promises and not feeling. It is important for you to acknowledge that. I can't. It just came out. Um, no. It's a gift. Not everyone has the same gift. Put it like this. I could draw, right? Can you draw? That's a gift. Not everyone has the same gift at all. In fact, let's, let's go into that scripture real fast, right? So the Bible says, so when it comes down to speaking in tongues, if you will, because that's, to me, that, that's, that, to me, that's a divider in the faith. When it comes down to speaking in tongues, according to scripture, if you can speak in tongue, it's cool, but the Bible says that's a language. So if it's a language, that means somebody has to interpret that language. So if there is no interpreter, why are you speaking another language if I can't understand you and it's something that the Spirit of God is trying to tell the church? Somebody lying. And it doesn't add up with scripture. So... That's why, that's why I challenge, man, I challenge every individual to get into the Word of God. Man, the Word of God speaks for itself in itself, man. Like, if you feel like you need to have some type of deliverance, some type of experience to experience Jesus, somebody deviating you away, deviating you away from the true gospel. If you trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I don't need a deliverance service. Jesus is the deliverer. I don't need somebody to come over there and say, let me deliver you from this specific sin. According to Scripture... If I trusted Jesus as my Lord and Savior, I am free indeed. He is the one who redeems me. And at that catechismic moment, I snatch you from the grace, by the grace of God, from the pits of hell. And you can experience freedom because the Bible says the Spirit of God has sealed you. It is a process. Watch this process. Sanctification. During that sanctification process of you meditating on the Word of God, and in prayer, I will start to, watch this, deliver you from lust. Yes. I will start to deliver you from homosexuality. I will start delivering you from whatever it is, lies, or whatever it is. I will start doing these things because Jesus is the one who does it. Yes. I don't need anointed oil. I don't need that. I don't need, I don't need people to come around me and circle me and say, let's cast this thing, whatever is in you. I don't need that. I need, give me the word of God. Give me this Jesus. I don't want your Jesus. And we are living in this time. And the reason why I say it, because uh, the black and Hispanic community, right? We, we literally, we, we're driven by emotional people. We're emotional people. Let's be real. We grew up in the church. We grew up in, in whatever it is, Pentecostal movement, the Catholic movement. We grew up in all that stuff. So if I don't do this, if I don't, whatever it is, if I don't shake, if nobody throw a blanket on me, I'm not saved. 
Come on, man. Hey, look. That's why it's called the gospel according to Satan. Because there is another gospel out there. And it's a sad, mo- it's a sad thing because this perversion actually came from an area. It came from Canada. And it just happened to manifest itself over here. You know why? Because individuals get tired of the gospel. If you get tired of the gospel, you have not fully grasped the gospel yet. If you get tired of it, you need to hear something else. That's why the scripture says these individuals will have itching ears. Watch what Ray Steadman says. He says, whenever people lose God, they lose themselves. Whenever people lose God, they lose themselves. Uh, The apostasy will take place and many churches will remain full. March Hitchcock, Hitchcock said that. He says that the churches will be full not knowing that they're sitting under an apostate preacher and they're receiving a false doctrine, a false gospel. He says, and the churches will remain full. Why? Because they're going and gravitating, excuse me, gravitating to a false hope, if you will. Talk to me. Oh, oh, I can't wait till I get to that verse. Give me a second now. I'm going to answer your question in just a second. Um, I will tell you right now, uh, according to Scripture, if they're not operating from the Holy Spirit, that means they're operating from another spirit, and it's not the Spirit of God. So therefore, if they're not operating from the Holy Spirit, right? Watch, when it comes down to the Holy Spirit, the Holy... Man, look, when it comes down to ministries that always uh, exhort, oh, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, this... According to scripture, if the Holy Spirit is within you, he only points to one person, and that is Jesus. Jesus said it in his own words in the book of John. He says, when that spirit comes, he would testify of the truth. Prior scripture, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Therefore, that spirit that's within you, which is the Holy Spirit, would only testify of Christ alone and no one else. So if that spirit is pointing to man... If it's pointing to your sister in Christ and saying, your sister need to deliver you, that person need to deliver you, that is not the spirit of the living God. That is another spirit. So therefore, if we have the Holy Spirit, that means there's other spirits among us too. If there's a false gospel, that means there's a true gospel among us too. And it's going to take... <laughs> and it's going to take, it's going to take an individual to get into the word of God to differentiate what is real and what is not. As we start this message and we get into certain points, the, this message is just the beginning of, of, of the three part of this, this message in itself. This is just an introduction, if you will. Next week, we will talk about how, we can, um, how can we spot an apostate? How can we spot these false teachers? And how can we spot if we're, if we're being driven away from someone else? The third one, the third message in this three-part message would be, um, we would describe these false gospels. There's 10 of them among us in America today. And a lot of us uh, who call themselves Christian, a lot of people call themselves Christian. I'm not going to put it on us. A lot of people who call themselves Christian are literally operating under these false gospels. No, no, we didn't didn't even get started here yet. So why would you want to snip it next week? All right, so it actually, the movement started in the 1980s. This movement in the 1980s, I'm not going to say the man's name, but it was an individual who were radical for the Lord Jesus. I believe that they had good intentions in the beginning. And um, that's, why, that's why it's very important not to go based off of your zeal. Right? So I believe that their intentions started good. So they started this movement of tent revivals, right? These tent revivals, individuals will come there and then they, it's like this. I believe individuals get tired of the gospel message. They feel like the message in itself cannot deliver people or whatever it is because these individuals, I believe they didn't come to faith in the first place. So they feel like they have to build a, 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 a platform, if you will, of miracle signs and wonders. So they, so they gravitated to audience people 
And people were coming to the tent because they thought people were getting healed and things. Jesus, God might have healed individuals in that place. But I want you to, I want you to know that the devil does healing too, false miracles. Right? So Jesus said, even if we go back to scripture, and now this is not even in our notes, let's go back to it. Jesus said in the Bible, when these individuals, he came to a specific area in the coast, he, he came out and they said, man, all right, if you're this Messiah, show us a sign. And Jesus looked at him. He says, I will give you no sign but the sign of Jonah. Right? And, and, and I'm pretty sure everybody was like, what is he talking about? The only sign he's telling you, he says, I'm going to die. Three days later, I'm going to raise and I'm going to go up to heaven. That is the sign of Jonah. That's what he was talking about. So he was talking about his death, his burial, and his resurrection. So, but these individuals, they wanted a sign, they wanted a wonder. He knew their hearts, he knew what they, what they were there for. So he told them, he says, uh, yo, that's not what we're doing. I'm, the only sign I'm going to give you when I die and I raise from the grave. And then, of course, he departed. And I believe that individuals who are intrigued by sign and wonders, the enemy gives signs and wonders. If you're going to church for a sign and wonder, if you feel like the manifestation is happening there or whatever it is, the spirit of God is in there, the preacher preaching, the drums are going off, so you feel it rising up in you. You think that is, you think it's, you think it's uh, the spirit of God when it's really your emotions. These individuals literally took this, right? They perfected it and it started to spread in America. So that's how this movement, charismatic movement came about. Okay. Yeah. It would be the same in the same room. I would say that because if they're that's what they're coming for, we know why they're coming. I come to church because I want to hear about the Lord Jesus. I want to hear like what God is trying to tell me through the scripture. I'm not there for the man. Like, I, I know individuals who are in false churches, and they feel like if the man didn't lay hands on them, God ain't blessed them tonight. Yeah. Like, they literally felt forsaken. Like, like, why the pastor ain't touch me? Is there something on me? Like, individuals felt like that, and it caused them to deviate away from the church. And this is happening all over America. I mean, if I could be honest with you, there's, there, when I tell you I was looking at things that were happening and individuals who were falling, right? Or should I say just, man, like God exposing these individuals, a lot of these mega churches who have the same formula, they're experiencing attacks. Like they're literally falling in front of faith, yeah. like legit. And I'm not going to mention names because it's, it's churches here in, in Miami that are experiencing this stuff. You know what I'm saying? Talk to me, Kev. Yeah. Oh, of course. Of course. It, 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 go, it correlates with what's going to happen in the end times. How is this false Messiah going to win the people over? Signs and wonders. No, it's not. It's, it's, a difference, it's a difference in believing in signs and wonders. I know God can do this. I know God can heal. I know he can do that. But if you're going to church for that, that's wrong. That's when, that's when you go wrong. These individuals, even scripturally, these individuals were attaching themselves to Christ because what he can do for the individual and not for him. People are going to church for God's hand and not for God. So, that, so there's a difference. So what these individuals doing, these false teachers, they're literally, they're pimping out God's hand. They're pimping out the Holy Spirit and not the word of God. But when we hear scripture, scripture says, if you lift me up, I would draw what? All men. I don't need to say there's signs and wonders at this church. I don't need to say um, I've seen people fall. I don't need to say that. All I can say is Jesus is here and God says he's going to draw them. And, and, and that's, why, that's why churches that teach sound doctrine have less of a crowd. Because we live in an adulterous generation that gets offended for everything. The offense is everywhere. A millennial Gen Z generation, as you, if you will. Talk to me. With blood. Jesus. Yeah. 
So um, listen to what listen to what Jesus responded to her when he touched her. They said that he touched her. He says, man, I felt power come from me. The apostles were like, uh, Jesus, everybody touching you. Like, what do you, he said, no, no, power left me. And then he looked at the woman. He, the woman heard him. She fell to her knees and he looked at her. He says, daughter, what made you well? Exactly. Her faith made her well. She knew that Jesus had the solution. She knew it was Jesus. Jesus is called the healer. Jesus is everything. But if you're going, spe- she went to the man. You, 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 you catch what I'm saying? She went to the Christ. Many of us are going to the churches because of the miracles and not the Christ. Do I believe that Christ can heal? Yes, because he is the great healer. But I'm going there for him. If he heals me, glory to God. If he doesn't hear me, glory to God. You know what I'm saying? Does it make sense? So there's a difference. So there's a difference of going to him for one specific reason, but there's a difference of going to him because I know what he can do for me. Does that make sense? So it goes back to even fasting. What is your purpose of fasting? You know what I'm saying? A lot of people fast because I want God to get me a car. Hello? Where's that in scripture? Um, I want to pass this test. Where is that in scripture? I want to be delivered from this spirit. Where is that in scripture? The reason the purpose of fasting is to draw near to God. Because I know if I draw near to God, I can be, watch this, delivered. So if you're going for the motive of I need something from God, you will never receive deliverance. But if I'm going because I need God, you will receive deliverance. Just like the woman with the issue of blood, I went to Christ because I had a severe need and I know he was the only one that can do it. The doctors couldn't do it, meaning the the preacher couldn't do it. That other person couldn't do it. But I knew who could do it and his name is the Lord Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? So I want you to understand, so whenever, a person, whenever people lose God, they lose themselves. And March Hitchcock, I love what he says. He says, the apostasy, the apostasy will take place and many churches will remain full. I, need, I want to emphasize something. Only a repented church can win unrepented people. Wow. Only a repented church can win an un- unrepented world. Whenever God starts judgment, or whenever God chastens an individual, guess where he starts? Right in here. That's why it's very important for us to acknowledge who we're sitting under. What am I listening to? Because whenever judgment comes, he's coming for the church first. Individuals say, man, I, that's my Lord. How do I know this? Revelation chapter two. He says, repent. He says, or I will take out your lampstand. He, he, ain't say, he ain't say the government going to do it. He, he ain't say that they're going to close your church, they're going to do all this. Maybe it's not the, the government is doing it. Maybe God is allowing that to happen because there's something wrong in that church. That's why it's very important for us to acknowledge the times that we're living in. It's very important for us to get into the scripture. God allows to chasten his church to come back to him. I believe that we're experiencing the great revival that we want to experience when the church first repents and comes to Christ. So as we get into it, the gospel according to Satan, um, the Bible warning against apostasy serves two primary purposes. And if you can, take out your pens, your notebooks, and take down these notes as we go through these slides. Jay, hit me with this, this slide. Okay, there you go. So the, Bible, the Bible's warning against apostasy serve two primary purposes. I love what Andy Wood says. He says, the English word apostasy is derived from two Greek words. The first word is um, uh, preposition apo, uh, apple, which means away from. The second word is the verb his, um, histomy, which means to stand. Thus, apostasy means to stand away from. Apostasy refers to a departure from um, known or previously embraced truth. So apostasy is individuals who came to the truth, who heard the truth, but they, they leave the truth. And then he says the subject of apostasy has little to do with the condition of the unsaved world. 
has little to do. The world is already away from God. They, they can't go. There, there is no apostasy taking place in the world. They're already away from God. The apostasy takes place in the church. And it says, it says, unsaved world, which has always rejected divine truth. Therefore, nothing has from way up. Therefore, nothing has nothing from which to depart. Rather, apostasy pertains to the spiritual temperature within God's church. That's why it's very important for us to acknowledge what the preacher is preaching. Like, what, what is he, what is, what is he preaching? Is he preaching from the word of God or is he preaching from self? Is he preaching something that I want to hear? Or is he preaching what the, war, the, the Lord says to preach? That's why it's very important for us as individuals to get into our word. You cannot watch this. You can escape deception if you're in your word. You can be deceived if you're not in it. Escape from deception starts in the word of God. So only a repented church can win over an unrepented world. The first, thing, the first thing as far as the, the Bible warns against apostasy, it serves two primary purposes. The first one is everyone is exhorted to be sure of their salvation. Everyone. In fact, the scripture actually tells us to examine ourselves, right? One's eternal destination is not a trifling matter. Listen, Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, to examine ourselves to see whether we are in the faith. Examine yourself. Examine your fruit. Watch this. Go to your brother and sister, man. Do you see change in me? Like, that, that is very, it takes, man, it takes a person that's in humility to go to their brother and say, man, have I changed? Right? One, um, one test of true faith is love for others, 1 John 4. Another is good works. Another is good works. That's why the Bible says faith without works is dead. But a faith that works is, is a faith that, that is secure. Because it, it, ain't, it ain't saying that I'm working my way to have faith. No, it means it sh- we could tell you have faith by the way you work. That's what that scripture means. Like I know that you're rooted in the word of God because how you, how you do and how you serve in the church or how you serve people or how you love people. That is evidence of your salvation. But if you mean, if you have a book full of notes and you still have a horrible attitude, I would ask for you to examine yourself. Because you're taking them notes in vain. I don't know what you're doing at the crib. But you... <laughs> Y'all got this? Anyone can claim to be Christian, but those who are truly saved will bear fruit. A true Christian will show through words, actions, and doctrine that he follows the Lord. So it goes back to who are you following? No point intended. Who you follow? <laughs> Christians bear fruit in varied degrees based on their level of obedience and their spiritual gifts, but all Christians bear fruit as the Spirit produces it in the life of a Christian. The Spirit is the Spirit of God that produces this fruit, meaning you cannot produce false fruit because eventually those fruits will crack in your face. Like it will start seeping through. Oh, he, 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 he faking this. She faking this. It, it, will, it will start creeping through. It, your true nature will start to manifest itself. You can't fake fruit because it's the Spirit's fruit. Just as true followers of Jesus, we will be able to see evidence of their salvation. According to 1 John chapter 4, verse 13, apostates will eventually be made known by their fruit or lack thereof. It will show. Um, I, I, love what, um, I love something that March Hickok, or actually another pastor, he, he gave an illustration. He says how easy deception really is. He said, deception is so easy. He says there was a little kid who, who was so naive walking in the forest with his friend. And as he was walking in the forest with his friend, he saw um, rabbit droppings. If you've seen rabbit droppings, they look like little pebbles, right? And, and the man, the boy who was naive, he says, what's that? His friend was like, I don't know if you, but I know that if you eat that, you would be a, the smartest person in the world. So the naive, kid says, the naive kid says, okay, let me take the pebble. He popped them in his mouth. Mm-mm. <laughs> and immediately he spits them out and he says, man, it tastes like poop. And the boy says, see, you're getting smarter already. <laughs> and that's exactly what Satan does. He rears you in. 
He rears you in with things that, that you are naive of. That's why it's very important for us to get into the Word of God because Satan attacks individuals who are naive to the Word of God. He can deceive you if he places Christ in that position. If he says, Jesus says this, watch this, he went to, when Jesus went into the wilderness, he used the Word of God against him. Meaning if you don't know the Word of God, it's easy for you to be deceived. That's why he says, that's why even David Wilkerson, when he was on the screen, he these individuals, were, it, they were literally being persuaded. They were saying Jesus, they were saying these things, but the gospel that they were preaching does not match the gospel of the word of God. Getting into the word is very important. Watch this. No one is exempt of deception. No one. You have your hand up or you doing push-ups? Oh, my bad. I mean, let's say whatever. Okay. You said that's the fruit of the Spirit? No, I'm saying like what like basically what I think. Uh-huh. What I think. Like that would be like one of the One of the fruit of the spirits is love. Yes, Lord. Masia hit him. What's the fruit of the spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. I think I'm missing one. Faith, 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 faith. Those are the fruits of the spirit. And and Okay, okay. Okay, from works, I'm going to go with works. So works would be your intentions and your motives behind the works that you do. Does that make sense now? So why are you doing it? What's the purpose? What is driving your works? Is it your faith driving your works or you're trying to prove something? Or you're trying to win something or you're trying to win people over? Does that make sense? So a, a genuine work of faith, right, would be an individual that says, I do this unto God. Everything I do. And it would be evident by the fruit of the Spirit, by the way he loves, by the way he serves, by his faithfulness, his self-control, things of that sort. That's how you know an individual is actually doing it from God and not from his evil intentions or his motives. Does that make sense now? Because they go together. Fruit of spirits and works, they go together. They're twins. Whatever, well, more than twins. So, um... So there's a specific verse, so it goes back to, and, and this is the verse that we're going to dissect next week. So fruits of the Spirit. What is the opposite of the fruits of the Spirit? I love what um, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 and 5 says this. It says, but mark this. I love this because it says, pay attention to this. Watch this. Mark this. Write this down, if you will. Right? He says, there will be terrible times in the last days. The last days derived from when Jesus died on the cross. Watch this. No, not even that. Before that, when Jesus appeared on the scene, that's when the last days started. Are we closer to the last days, last days? Yes, we are. So the last days started the moment Jesus ascended to heaven and, and, and the church age started. The last days started. That's when time clock started. But the end, the last of the last days, I believe that it was ushered in in May 1948 when Israel became a nation. That's when the end times, that's when the last days really started for, for us, if you will. So it says there will be terrible times in the last days. Watch. People will be lovers of themselves. It sounds like our generation today. So that's the opposite of the fruit of the spirit, right? It says people will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money. Emphasis added because if we look on social media, everybody got a wad of money on their ear. Um, boastful, individuals who are prideful, right? It says they're proud. Watch, they're abusive. I can't wait to dissect this next week because that's a broader sense, right? Disobedient to their parents. We see that every time going to the supermarket and watch the kids, how they're disrespectful to their parents. In fact, um, the government is taking the privilege of, of parents even spanking their kids because they said that's abuse. Government, where you at? I'm going to beat my kids. Beating them. Yeah, it, it, would, it would tie into it. Yes. So it says disobedient to their parents, ungrateful. That's our generation today. Unholy individuals who, who, who can't be set apart. They're unholy. And it says this, without love, generation today. 
Watch this, and it says unforgiving. Woo! Unforgiving. That probably hit home for a lot of us in here, huh? Watch. Slanderous. Gossip about who? Watch this. Without self-control. Watch this. Brutal. Not lovers of good. And it says treacherous. It says rash. Watch this. Conceited. Watch this. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And now I love what it says this. Having a form of godliness but denying its power. So, so now let's, 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 let's sum this up real quick. He is not talking about individuals who are living in the world. He's talking about the church. He is talking about the church. Why am I saying he's talking about the church? Because everything on this list describes individuals who are in the world. We don't need to talk about them. How do we know that he's talking about the church? Having a form of godliness but denying its power. I love what he says with this. Have nothing to do with such people. But I'm cruel. Right? I offended you. I say this, I say that. Have nothing to do with such people. Why? Because you are who you hang with. What? The, people who, who, the people you hang with either will uplift you to God or take you away from God. Have nothing to do with these people who says that they come to church, they trust in Christ as Lord and Savior, but their life lived contrary to what Scripture says. Have nothing to do with them. And we'll talk about that next week, right? So John Philip says this. He says, the river of apostasy is rising today. The perilous times of which Paul wrote upon us. When it reaches flood level, the river will un, um, un, yeah, inundate the earth in the final apostasy, which is the enthronement of the devil's Messiah as the world's God and king. And that's in 2 Thessalonians, in which we will talk about in the coming weeks. Right? He says, some think we can look forward to a worldwide spiritual awakening before the rapture. But the passage in 2 Thessalonians indicates the opposite. A worldwide departure from the faith can be expected. We are not expecting a worldwide revival to a sense. What we're expecting is a worldwide departure of the faith. My brothers and sisters, if you look at the news, if you look at just the churches, man, people are leaving the faith by the hundreds. In fact, if we look at, man, I guarantee you, pre-COVID, the individuals who were with you in the church are no longer with you in, in, in the church now. Because it seems like COVID came and just swept people away. I said in the middle of COVID, when we were sitting on the stage and when we were here and no one could join us in the gathering, I said, I believe that COVID was going to expose the sheep, the real from the fake. And that it did. Because there's many individuals who are among us, but they were not of us. So therefore they left us. So, and he, and he says, God might indeed send a revival before the rapture. I believe that a revival is coming, but I don't believe in a worldwide scale. I believe that it's going to be pockets of revival. I believe North Fire Baptist Church is going to experience a revival in the name of Jesus. I believe that. I, I believe that. So, it, it might be indeed a revival before the rapture, but the scripture do not prophesy one. So, so, God might very well say, man, look, that church is preaching. Let's bring the people there. All right? So revivals, I believe there's going to be pockets of revival. Why I say that? Because when I look at the news, uh, there's places in Tennessee that they're experiencing a mass revival. There's places in Canada that individuals who are not allowed to gather in the church, therefore, they left the four walls of the church, and now they're hiding in little dungeons and caves and little secret places, and they're experiencing revival day after day, night after night. So do I believe a revival is coming? I believe it, but by the pockets, but not by the worldwide scale. I believe that the great revival that we are anticipating is going to happen through the great, the great tribulation. When people are going to realize that, that that Messiah that they placed on the throne ain't the real Messiah. He was the devil the whole time. When, when the Jews are going to be like, oh, shoot, we messed up. Jesus was the Messiah. This, this false man is not the Messiah. And so at that moment, I believe revival is going to come, but persecution is, is going to come even more. But that's a whole nother message in itself. The second thing, and we're almost done. The second purpose of the Bible warning against apostasy is to equip the church to identify apostates. They can be known by their rejection of Christ, acceptance of heresy, and carnal nature. 
We can know them by their rejection of Christ, their acceptance of heresy, doctrine um, opposite of what Scripture tells, and their carnal nature. I live like the world. I live like the world. You can't even tell me apart. Only when I post a verse. God is first in my bio, but everything else does not match. You would know an apostate. You would know an individual. When trials, tribulation come, that individual is going to jump ship, and he's going to try to handle his situation on his own, forsake the church, forsake the gathering. I don't care about those people because my emotions and what I feel is more important than God. That's what these individuals are going to do. Why? Because biblical, uh, the biblical warning against apostates or apostasy, therefore, are warnings to those who are under the umbrella of faith without even having truly exercised faith. That's why I said a faith that is, has not been tested cannot be trusted. What, what, what makes an individual stand firm in his faith is when he experienced trials. That's how you know someone is genuine. The, the world is against you. The, the, everything is upon you. And, and you feel like you have nowhere else to go but to stand firm on your faith. That's how you know an individual is genuinely a believer in God. Scriptures such as Hebrews chapter 6 and Hebrews chapter 10 um, are warnings to pretend believers that they need to examine themselves before it's too late. My brothers and sisters, today is the day of salvation. The only reason why you woke up today is because of the grace of God. It was nothing else. You did not contribute until you waking up. You probably didn't pray before you went to sleep, but it was God's grace that woke you up. You were not supposed to wake up. You could have been sleeping with somebody and you're not married and you went to sleep and you still woke up because it's God's grace. He wants you to repent and come to him. You probably fell before you walked into this building. You probably was sinning before you did this. Before you did that, it's by grace of God that he brought you to this place so you could hear such message, so you could repent to him and come back to the Lord Jesus Christ. It is his grace alone. It is not you. You, can, you, you got no, no, no power. You got nothing you could do. There's nothing you could contribute to it. It is God alone. Christ alone. So scripture warns these individuals before it's too late. We got two more slides. Matthew 7, 22, um, 23 indicates that pretend believers whom the Lord rejects on judgment day are rejected because they lost faith, not because they lost faith, but because the Lord never knew them. They never had a relationship with him. Um, there are many people who love religion for religious sake, and are willing to identify themselves with Jesus and the church. It's not religion that gets you to heaven. There is religion and relationship, but it's the relationship that gets you to heaven. Religion is attached to that relationship. What is religion? Going to church, reading, praying. Those are religious aspects. But the relationship that you have with Christ is what gets you to heaven. For example, who wouldn't want eternal life and blessing, right? That's what people would say. However, Jesus warns us to count the cost of discipleship. An individual who is a genuine believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, they counted their cost. They knew that I would lose friends, I would lose um, family members, people would not like me, therefore I'm still going to stand for the Lord Jesus Christ. Like the old prophet would say, me and my household, we will what? serve the Lord, despite of, I don't care what my friend says, I don't care if they feel offended, I don't care, I'm here to please God and not people. True disciples of the Lord, we don't want to be followers, we want to be disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. So true disciples counted the cost, they will hate me, I get that. They would not like me, I get that, I will experience persecution, trials, tribulation, I will experience that, I count the cost, but it's still going to be worthy and it is worth it at the end. Right? So true believers have counted the cost and made the commitment. Apostates fail to do so. Apostates have a profession of faith at one time, but they did not possess the faith. Their mouth spoke something other than what their hearts believed. That's why he says their mouth, are, he says their, 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 their mouths are right here. They're talking about me, but their hearts are far from me. My brothers and sisters, evaluate your heart. Where is it? Is it, is it in the man who's preaching? It is in your emotions. It is in your first ideas. Is it, is it in these, it, these little notifications that you be receiving in your phone to, to self-gratify you, to lift you up? 
and, and, and they attach their name, man, look, I'm going to say it. If you have that app, Sprinkle of Jesus is a false app. It's not, it's not the gospel. It's, it's literally, it is literally a, a gospel of self-fulfillment. It's encouraging you. It is motivational speaking. It's not Jesus. Just because it says Jesus, it's not Jesus. So I advise you to evaluate what you're listening to and delete that. Real talk. Delete it. Because it, what it's doing is you are what you listen to. You are what you feed yourself. You are that. Eventually, if you listen to this enough, you'll start living that. Apostate starts within the church. Like the pro- I love what Mark Hitchcock said. He says, the problem is not the woodpecker outside the church. The problem is the termites inside the church. They eat themselves from the inside out. In fact, there's an illustration. There was an, in- there was an individual who was the maintenance man of a building on the 42nd floor. He noticed that the walls in the 42nd floor was cracking. Right. And so he went down to the, he, he went down looking on every floor and he noticed that certain areas was cracking, but he could not find where. Why is it cracking? So he called the um, um, archaeologist. Is it an archaeologist? Yeah. Architect. Yeah. I don't know where I'm at. So architect, he called the arch- architect and the architect said, OK, let me come expect the building. As he inspected the building, he didn't go to the top 42nd floor. He went to the bottom. And then, and then the guy was telling him, yo, the issue is on the 42nd floor. Why are you in the bottom? He says, no, the, 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 the issue on the 42nd um, floor is the manifestation of something that's happening in the foundation of the building. Meaning your foundation is everything. If your foundation is not rooted in Christ, you will start crumbling on the 42nd floor. A lot of Christians are on the 42nd floor cracking. I know you grew up in the church. I know that you compare yourself. I know you're doing all these things. You're crumbling on top because your foundation was shaken. And then come to find out, the, the, the architect, what he found out was there was a janitor who was a janitor in this, this, this building for so long, he, he was chipping away on the building, taking the concrete home for many years, for about 12 years, so, that he, so to the point that the foundation became unstable, so this started cracking from the top. In the same sense, if you sit under false doctrine, if you're not getting in your word, if you're not praying, your foundation will start cracking. It will start eating away because now your emotions are taking away the pieces of that foundation that Christ is supposed to be the solidified one. Your, your, your thoughts, um, this person that I'm listening to, this podcast, that YouTube video, this, that, they're taking away that solid foundation that only the word of God can give you. Make sure that you're rooted because the cracks start from the foundation of the church. Our last slide is this. Apostasy is not lost of salvation, but is evidence of a past pretension, presension, if you will. Meaning it's something that happened already. It was already starting. A lot of individuals don't fall from the faith until something drastic happens in their life. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3 to 4 says, For the time will come. And we're going to dissect this verse next week. This is the last verse in the last slide. For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. They will not put up with it. That message offends me. It makes me feel some type of way. My pastor didn't preach that. My mom didn't teach me that. That's something that, that they didn't teach me that in my household. So therefore, I'm not going to listen to that. Right? For the time will come when men will not put up with false or sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, this is important, they will gather around them a great number of teachers. What podcast are you listening to? What teacher are you listening to on YouTube? What illustration that got you intrigued and make you feel like, oh, he, he, he entertains me more than he preaching to me? What, what, what is that person that, that, that he just looks cool on a stage? What music you listening to? What this? He says, watch this, they will gather around them a great number, it's not one person, I, I, I don't want y'all to miss that, a great number of teachers. I, I'm going to be honest with you, I'm very biased when, I, when it comes down to preaching. I do not listen to everybody. I, I close my ear to a lot of stuff. Like, I'm the, I am not that type of person that I'm trying to get fed from that person, that person, no. There's one revelation, and that is the revelation of the Word of God. If that preacher does not deviate from the Word of God... That's who I'm listening to. I ain't listening. To I'm very biased. 
You call me what you want. I'm very biased. I don't listen to everybody. I don't go with the trend. I don't care if he look young. I don't, man, I don't care about none of that. I'm here for Jesus, not that man preaching. So it says, they will gather a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. So the reason why they're gravitate, ra- gravitating to individuals is because they're saying exactly what I want them to hear. That's why I said, be careful with that sprinkle of Jesus app. Because it's saying exactly what you want to hear. It's not telling you to deny yourself. It's telling you to love yourself. It's, it's, it's self-motivating. When, when the Bible says, deny yourself, you're a servant of all, not a servant of self. We'll talk about that next week. So it says this. It says, teach us to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. Does that sound like our generation today? How many of us adopted this thing of, of uh, astrology? I'm a lion. I'm a, I'm a Leo. I'm a, I'm a Libra. I'm all this. According to scripture, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm a Christian. Watch this. And if I am any animal, I'm not a lion. I'm not a Libra. I am a sheep of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, so you could be anything else. You could be a lion. You could be the eagle. You could, uh, you could fly. You could do all that. I am a sheep of the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, a sheep needs a shepherd. I cannot go off of my own understanding. I need someone to guide me. So if you're going to be something, be a sheep of the Lord Jesus Christ and allow the great shepherd to guide you. Hey, pastor, where can I get this? Where can I get? Where can I get this guidance? Watch this. The word of God. This is all you need, my brothers and sisters. Right here. There's truth only in here. Nothing else. Don't allow anyone else to tell you anything else if it's not coming from the word of God. Amen? Amen. So as we get ready to close out, I pray that this message, man, encourages you and open your eyes. And we have ears to hear what the spirit of God is telling the church in the last days. Let us stand up and let us pray. So as we prepare to close out, um, I'll say, come up here and minister with me. As we prepare to close out, man, I pray that, um, I pray, man, that we, we're attentive, man, to what God is trying to tell us. I do believe that we're living in the last days. I, I, I believe that um, we live in an emotional generation. We live in a, a generation that's offended about everything, self-fulfillment, self-love, self-this, self-that. It's all about you, how I feel. Um, that doesn't make me feel good. I'm coming in at church with the pastor, whatever it is. We live in that generation, and I need us to be attentive to that because, man, the devil is trying to do anything to derail you from eternity. Anything. Even if he has to put Jesus in front of it. He's going to use anything to derail you from the faith. He's going to do anything to point everything back to yourself, to how you feel, to develop something called doubt. To, de- to develop all these, these, these things that are contrary to what the Spirit of God is doing in your life. Just because you fell one day, you're not saved. That's, that's, that's not what Scripture says. Nothing can separate you from God. Nothing. Amen. If you're genuinely saved, nothing. You are loved. Nothing can snatch you out of my hand, Jesus says. Those are promises that we need to hold on to if we truly trusted Jesus as our Lord and Savior. So with our heads down, eyes closed, I'm going to say this. If you have not trusted Jesus into your life, and and tonight is the night of salvation for you, and and you know that genuinely you've been deceived for a long time. In fact, you've been participating in false theology, false churches, false doctrine, and you want to know the true gospel. And that gospel is the gospel that sets you free, that Jesus died, he rose, and he sits at the right hand of the Father. The Bible says that he is interceding for you and I to this day. Don't allow Satan to rob you of this moment. Don't allow pride to rob you of this moment. Don't allow doubt to rob you of this moment. They looking at me. They they talk, man, don't let none of that rob you of this moment. Those who are watching us online through our YouTube, our podcast, you too, send us a message. Tonight is the night of salvation. My brothers and sisters, this is just the beginning of one, uh, 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 a three-part message. 
I pray that this message sets us free in the name of Jesus, for we can stop living weak Christian lives. We are overcomers, victors in the name of Jesus. So if you have not trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand right now so we can go ahead and pray for you. Tonight is the night of salvation. Don't allow anything to rob you. Don't allow the devil to rob you of this moment. You know it. You have not been rejuvenated. You still look like the world. You still act like the world. Anyone in this room, in Jesus' name, okay, if you have been an individual who professed the faith, your lifestyle don't match it. I'm, I'm attack Christians right now. If you're a Christian in the faith, you trusted Christ, you said the prayer, but you feel like something is missing, for better words. I'm asking you to raise your hand right now so we could pray with you. Don't leave out of this place the same. God bless you, my brother. God bless you, my sisters. God bless you, my sister. God bless you, my sister in the back. Anyone else? God bless you, my brother. God bless you, my sister. Anyone else in this place? That's probably the best decision you ever made. I don't care if you got baptized. I don't care if you came up to the front three times. I don't care if you were born on the altar. All of us need prayer. I don't care if you grew up in the church. Stop it. You you better, hey, take that mask off. Take that pride off. Don't allow anything to rob you of this moment. Those who raise their hand, I'm asking you to do something bold. Hood terminology. Be a G about it. Leave the pews. There's individuals in the back waiting to pray for you. Don't be scared. Everybody who raised their hand, amen. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody. (laughs) Individuals waiting for you in the back. Nothing to be scared about. And for everyone else in this gathering, eyes closed, let us go ahead and pray. Father God, I thank you. I thank you for this opportunity, Lord God, to share your word. I thank you for your grace, your mercy. I thank you for everything that you're doing, Lord God, in in the church. I thank you for everything that you're doing in the lives of every individual that's standing up here. Whether they went because they needed prayer, whether they stood here, whether they feel embarrassed, whatever it is, Lord God, I pray that you minister to their hearts and their minds, Father God. I pray that you grant them peace, Jesus. When they walk out of these doors, Father God, the first thing that comes to their mind or the first thing in their heart is not to turn on um, social media or to turn on the radio, Father God, but to be focused on what you said today, Lord God. For them to have a desire, Jesus, to go home, to want to get into scripture, to cry out to God, Father God, saying, God, man, I need you. Simple as that, God, I need you. I need you to change my life. I need you to uh, transform me, God. I feel empty, God. I feel offended, God. I feel this, God. God, I pray that these are the individuals that do that, myself included, Jesus. Help us to be people of transparency. People, Father God, that that man, that doesn't matter what's in their way, they're going to run towards you regardless. That that are not um, directed or guided by their emotions, Jesus, but guided by the spirit of the living God, Father. I pray for revival in the lives of every individual in this place. Catch them on fire, Lord God. Come this Saturday, Lord Jesus, we're going to witness the fruit, Father God, of every message that's been preached, Jesus. I pray we go out there and invade darkness, Lord Jesus. Father God, and we proclaim one message that Jesus died, he rose, and he's coming back again. And I pray that these are the individuals that you use. I ask that you protect them on their way home, guide them, Father God. Man, just be with them, Lord. They're your children, Jesus, before I could lead them in any way, God. I submit them unto you, God, and I thank you. You're worthy, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.